All right, now we can talk. Now we can start. All right. Um, so thanks for coming, folks. Um, so my name is Tatiana, and uh, this event or this talk is about the tasks of the left uh, in the post Pink Tide era. Um, so I'm sure that a lot of folks know, but uh, when we're talking about Pink Tide's governments, we're talking about you know governments in the early 2000s in Latin America that mostly supported by the working class sought to bring about reforms while also conciliating with both imperialism and big capital in their countries. And so now we're in this you know, post Pink Tide moment uh, with uh, the rise of right wing governments in Argentina, uh, in Brazil, uh, in Mexico. Mexico is taking a, a little bit of a different kind of course with uh, Lopez Obrador, who looks like he's poised to win the presidency. He's about uh, 20 points above um, the next candidate. So for the first time, a center left candidate in Mexico. So really what we want to talk about in this panel are what are the tasks of the left uh, in this context? Um, and we're going to be taking up precisely these countries. Uh, and so we have Paula Varela, uh, who uh, is a militant with the Partido de Trabajadores Socialistas, the party of socialist workers in Argentina. Uh, she's a professor at the Universidad de Buenos Aires. Um, and uh, uh, investigadora, yes, and a researcher, um, uh, Conicet. And then we have, and so she's going to talk about Argentina. We have Jimena here, uh, who uh, is a militant of the Movimiento de Trabajadores Socialistas um, and a professor at the UNAM in Mexico City. Um, and my name is Tatiana. And I uh, live in New York, but I used to live in Brazil. I lived in Brazil for three and a half years and was a militant of the uh, Movimento Revolucionario de Trabalhadores, the movement of revolutionary workers. Um, and I also am a writer and editor uh, for Left Voice. Um, so before we begin, um, I also wanted to sort of dedicate and acknowledge uh, three people in particular that I wanted to sort of dedicate this panel to one from each of the countries that we're going to be talking about. Uh, from Brazil, uh, Marielle Franco, which many of you all may have heard about. Uh, she's a, she was a city councilwoman for the, uh, the PESOL, the Party of Socialism and Liberty. Uh, she is a, was a black woman, a lesbian woman, who was gunned down in the streets of Rio uh, about two months ago. Um, and. Uh, then also uh, from Mexico, uh, Roxana Hernandez, who, is, uh, who was a trans woman who was in the migrant caravan, uh, who was seeking asylum in the US um, and was detained uh, in a detention center and died in ICE custody just a couple days ago. Um, and then from Argentina, uh, Santiago Maldonado, uh, who, uh, you know, this is, a, I guess, a, a less recent case about 10 months ago, um, was, uh, disappeared uh, after being at a mobilization in support of indigenous rights. Um, and uh, there were massive mobilizations uh, asking and uh, where Santiago Maldonado is, uh, was, uh, with the knowledge that uh, it was the state that, that did it. So um, I want to, yeah. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, those uh, important people and, and uh, what's at stake really when uh, we talk about Latin America and imperialism and so forth. So I'm going to start off talking a little bit about the situation in Brazil. Uh, Brazil is very complicated, so hopefully uh, this will be good. All right. <laughs> so uh, we're going to start out uh, like 10 years ago, right? Um, in June of 2008, when, uh, just to sort of show a contrast, right? So in Brazil, ten, you know, 10 years ago, the New York Times wrote a piece in June called, uh, about Brazil, and it said, strong economy propels Brazil to the world stage. And it said, you know, Brazil is South America's largest economy, and it's finally poised to realize its uh, long anticipated potential as a global power. Um, at this point, uh, Inácio Lula da Silva was president. He was with the Workers' Party. Uh, he was starting his second term. He was, you know, dubbed by Obama the most popular politician in the world. 
And he was very much a favorite of the Brazilian working class and had built uh, a capitalist consensus around him, around um, you know, maintaining massive profits for the capitalists. Uh, he and the Workers' Party, you know, sort of were, were born from uh, massive metal workers strikes in the 1980s uh, during the transition uh, from a U.S.-backed military dictatorship in Brazil to uh, democracy. And, you know, after running for president several times and losing several times, Lula uh, rode, you know, the pink tide wave and made it to the presidency. And his presidency was really characterized by massive profits for the capitalist uh, and a booming economy mostly based on exports of soy and steel, as well as Petrobras becoming a very important oil industry. Um, and in, in this context, uh, where the capitalists are making huge profits, uh, you know, Lula provided uh, modest uh, welfare programs, you know, crumbs, really, uh, compared to the scale of the wealth produced, but also uh, really meaningful to the people who received those crumbs. You know, uh, when I lived in Brazil, people, it was really common for people to say, like, you know, I, we didn't have meat on the table until Lula, you know, um, it, for, for workers to say that. It also, you, you know, he expanded credit a lot. And so it allowed working class people to, for the first time, be able to buy washing machines, furniture, cars, things like that, uh, things that they wouldn't have thought possible in the past, um, you know, creating very much uh, a, a working class base for Lula and people who really supported him. Um, but of course, Lula's presidency was one of class conciliation. Uh, it was an attempt to show, you know, uh, that you can rule for those on the top and those at the bottom at the same time. And it was this idea that, that this is the new and realistic left, right? Um, that, you know, we need to give up on these ideas of insurrection and revolution. That's like old and, you know, whatever. Um, and that realistically what we need to do is to make life better for working class people is humanize capitalism. And, and that's the best best way forward. And uh, really the story of Brazil and what I want to try to get to today is that, the, that this is a failure, that, that doesn't, that's not true, that that doesn't work. Uh, it's a story of the, the failure of this uh, project of a humanized capital. Um, and it's a story uh, of the particular failure in a semi-colonial country where imperialism and big capital, both national and international, uh, refuse to allow even the smallest concessions, particularly during times of economic crisis. Um, so where we're at now, 10 years later, is that uh, you know Juma was impeached two years ago, uh, the, the Workers' Party president. Uh, Lula's in jail. And the Brazilian economy is in shambles. Uh, crime is high. Rio is militarized. Uh, the, 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 the new president, the soft coup president, his approval ratings are like 3%. You know, we think Trump's pr approval ratings are low. No, 3%. Um, and there is, you know, small but important mobilizations, quite small at this point, uh, calling for a return to the military dictatorship. And so, how did this happen <laughs> in 10 years? And that's, I guess, the question to, to think about. So I'm going to fast forward a couple years after, you know, and, uh, and first talk about what happened in June of 2013. Uh, because I think uh, w part of what we see in Brazil, I think it's easy to say, oh, there's just this big right wing shift. Um, and yes, I mean, absolutely, in politics, the right wing is in the government. But also, uh, there have been left mobilizations. And I, and I want to point to that, because in June of 2013, uh, there were some of the biggest mobilizations uh, in, in, you know, in Brazilian history with uh, where, you know, the, the PT government was beginning to implement some austerity measures and was like, all right, guys, you know, the, the economy, we need to, you know, fix it. So let's, uh, let's up the prices for the metro and the, the, uh, and the buses. And what resulted was a huge explosion of mobilizations. We're talking about over a million people in dozens and dozens of cities, uh, particularly of youth, uh, who, uh, who were against the rise in the bus fares. But then it went beyond that, because very quickly, Juma was like, OK, forget it. Like, no, 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 I won't raise the bus fares. We're cool. Like, go home. And they didn't go home. The, the, the protesters didn't go home. They, uh, they kept mobilizing. And they talked about the corruption of politicians. They talked, about, they talked against the World Cup, which if you, know, you all know, Brazil, World Cup, we're really good 
at soccer, the best in the world. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's a big deal for, for Brazilians to say, like, we don't want the World Cup in our country because actually we think you should invest in schools and in education because, you know, people die in the lines at the hospital because there aren't enough doctors. And, like, we don't want the World Cup in our country. And that was what, uh, you know, the youth, this sector of youth was saying in 2000 of 2013. They were, uh, and it was a first sort of break with the PT, uh, with the Workers' Party, saying, you know what, you're a party of austerity. Um, and when the crisis comes, when economic crisis comes, it's going to be on the back of the working class and of the youth that we're going to have to pay for the crisis. And so, you know, June of 2013, uh, that was a sort of first break. But um, then, you know, the, the, this whole process continues, um, and, and uh, more austerity, uh, and the working class is, is, is reje rejects the PT uh, more and more. Um, and at the same time, uh, there's an e economic crisis in Brazil, and the capitalists are getting, are getting antsy. Uh, they want further austerity measures. And so as a result, uh, the Juma is impeached uh, in 2016, in August, uh, on charges of corruption. So the formal charges is that she broke these fiscal laws. It's these laws that like literally all of the politicians break. Um, and so really you could see that the impeachment vote wasn't about you know, uh, it, wa it wasn't about corruption. It w you could see it when the Chamber of Deputies, they had, they, each person could go give a speech about, like, for the one minute long speech, and they would say, and a whole bunch of them were like, for the traditional family and against gay people. And one guy even, like, said the name of a military leader who tortured and killed people. He said, you know, for, I forgot the name of the person, but for, you know, this person. Um, and, and so you could tell that, and none of them talked about corruption, so you could tell it wasn't about that, you know? Um, they didn't talk about these supposed crimes. Um, and in fact, when Juma was impeached, 60% of the members of Congress were also being investigated for corruption, so, uh, um, and this coup was the coup was led by um, a by a right wing party, uh, the PMDB, uh, that was actually in the vice presidency. So the PT makes a coalition with the PMDB in order to arrive to the presidency, um, and you know Juma, uh, and and that's a sector that helps impeach Juma and bring uh, the vice president Michel Temer to the presidency. The coup was also supported uh, by the. Uh, by the right-wing PSDB, um, as well as, um, and this is important, the, the judicial branch that uh, had some key figures, including Sergio Moro, who were actually uh, trained by the U.S. government, right, um, and, and went through courses by the U.S. government. And, you, and, and, and the judicial system had very selective, very clearly selective attacks during, during this time period. Um, and... Uh, and so these were the different sectors, as well as uh, the, the media. Uh, Hedge Global, which is a very right-wing, like, kind of like Fox News, um, but really powerful media uh, network that actually supported the military dictatorship in its time. So those were the sectors that were behind, uh, behind the, the soft coup in, in Brazil. And really what they wanted was they wanted uh, faster austerity measures than uh, what Juma was, was giving. Uh, the PT made super clear. They were super down with implementing austerity and cuts and making sure the working class paid for the crisis. Absolutely, uh, and, and they were implementing those things. Uh, but these right-wing sectors uh, wanted these cuts faster and stronger. And the thing is that the PT, as a party of class conciliation, had this working class base that made it more difficult for them to do that. So they were like, so these right-wing sectors uh, implement this soft coup, impeach Juma, and uh, put in power Michel Temer in 2016. <laughs> and really importantly, um, the Workers' Party, the PT, totally refuses to fight. Uh, I was in Brazil while all of this was going down. And uh, like I mentioned before, the, the PT actually um, was born of strikes, right? Um, and they actually run the, the largest labor union. Um, they're in the leadership of the largest labor union in Brazil. Um, so they know what strikes are, and they know the power of the working class. And yet, there were exactly 
they, there weren't strikes. They didn't organize the working class against, uh, against the coup, a coup that, that we all knew would mean deeper, faster austerity measures. And it was because you know, they were more afraid of the power of the working class than they were afraid of being impeached by the right wing. Um, so, you know, Juma's impeached uh, by her own vice president, uh, by, and, and there was almost no fight put up. They had some marches. I went to one where uh, they, they had a stage, and there were thousands and thousands and thousands of people in the streets, but they just had a stage that have speakers, and the speakers would be like, this is fascism, and then they'd have a samba band come up next, and I'd be like, guys, if this is fascism, like, why is there a samba band? <laughs> like, come on. Um, so... Anyway, so that's kind of how they, they, they fought, which was not, not fighting. And so, um, you know, we, absolutely this is an advance of the right, uh, but it also is, a, a, and I would say that, that since there's uh, intense political polarization in Brazil uh, with potential, uh, with obviously the right advancing, but also there being potential for the left. Um, and I think it's the, the, the strategy of ca class conciliation of the Workers' Party um, and their completely traitorous leadership that, that keeps uh, allowing the right to advance and advance and advance. Um, and, you know, a year ago, we were in a really different situation in Brazil. Uh, in Brazil, a year ago, there had been two general strikes. Uh, they were, in, in May, there had been like 150,000 people who marched in Brasilia um, attempting to get rid of, the, of uh, Michel Temer because there was a tape that emerged where he basically like said that bribery was fine. He like endorsed bribery in this like tape that everyone heard, everyone, you know, and, uh, and, and there were hundreds of thousands of people who, and workers who, who, who were mobilized. Um, and they were mad at these cuts and austerity measures that the Demet pres presidency had had implemented. Um, you know, they 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 were mad at the corruption scandals of basically all of Demet's cabinet. Um, and so there were, you know, two two general strikes and uh, against the the pension reform and against labor reform. Um, but, and, but instead of, the, again, the Workers' Party leadership, the leadership of the unions, uh, you know, uh, continuing to organize general strikes, to organize a general strike that was more than a day long, uh, they really tried to contain the movement, right? So they, uh, they organized a strike, and then they were like, okay, well, you know, there's no, like, people don't want to continue. Um, but we can see by the fact that even with their very lukewarm mobilizations, uh, there were still so many people mobilized that there was actually a base of people who did want to fight. Uh, and, but, but still, you know, the Temer's measures passed, you know. Uh, there was a freezing of education and healthcare budgets uh, for 15 years. Uh, complete gutting of labor legislation and, and uh, pension reform that would completely deny uh, retirement pensions to millions of, of Brazilians. Um, and, and so it was really, you know, uh, the, the right was able to advance, but because uh, the workers, the, the unions led by the Workers' Party uh, refused to really put up a fight, uh, to put up a real fight. And now it's you know uh, a year from then, and we're in a much more reactionary situation in Brazil. Um, the the situation has become much more right wing. Um, the coalition that I had mentioned at the beginning, the 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 PT, the Workers Party, had been able to put together a coalition of uh, you know when they were ruling of not just the working class uh, that that supported them, but a coalition of um, of uh, several different sectors of important capitalists in, in Brazil. We have uh, Petrobras, which is the oil company, uh, which is uh, partly nationalized, partly uh, privatized. Uh, we have the financial sector, we have, uh, and we have massive agricultural businesses, and we have, uh, you know, contractors like uh, that, uh, like building contractors. And sort of Lula, what he had done was try to bring all of these sectors together and say, look, you all can profit all at the same time. While we give crumbs to the working class, this is going to work out great. Because there's an economic crisis, these different sectors are now in competition with each other, and this competition is absolutely conditioned by the interests, by imperialist interests. Um, and so we see, and so this is creating a huge crisis in Brazil right now. 
Um, we see, on one hand, uh, a sector that wants to privatize Petrobras, uh, which, like I said, is a combination of public and private. Um, and this privatization is very clearly in the interests of multinational corporations. So, I mean, we saw it like a couple of years ago, there were, you know, uh, like Snowden leaked that the US government was, was in fact spying on Brazil and particularly spying on Brazil around uh, Petrobras um, because you know the, the US wants oil and, and, and Brazil has qu quite a bit of oil, the, the pre-salt oil that, that they had uh, found. Um, and so what we've seen is in the past years of the, the judicial branch has pay played a role of uh, of investigating corruption charges uh, targeted in particular at uh, targeted in particular at these at some sectors of Brazilian um, big Brazilian capital at big Brazilian global players and placing limits on them. For example, Aldebaran, which is a construction company, wanted to rebuild Iraq. Like that was they were there to build, rebuild Iraq. Petrobras, uh, like I said, was one of the biggest oil companies. But both have been targeted by these corruption investigations, putting limits on these sectors, uh, and and then in that way strengthening like large landowners. Uh, that, that control quite a bit of Brazil. And so um, the political representation of these, um, I'm seeing how long I've talked for, um, the political representation of, of the landowners, and in, in particular would be Bolsonaro, who is in some ways a lot like Trump, very right wing, um, very, uh, tends towards being more nationalist um, and really reactionary, like anti-gay, like, you know, borderline pro-military dictatorship. Um, and so in this context, uh, we ha saw just last week these uh, small small business owners, small business truck drivers uh, who organized pickets and, you know, put the Brazilian economy into disarray, calling on the government to implement further austerity in order to provide diesel subsidies to them. So we see uh, these sectors sort of beginning to mobilize, and in fact, sectors of those, of, of, of those people saying, actually calling for a military dictatorship. On the other hand, we also saw last week Petrobras workers who went on strike against privatization. Um, but it was a strike that was considered illegal, and very quickly the union bureaucracy was like, no, 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 no stop, no, no more strike, um, because they were going to get fined, and they said, we can't have political strikes, and so here we are. Um, so, you know, in this sort of whirlwind of, of 10 years, the, you know, when we went from you know, one year, uh, the, this, the working class very much being at the center, a central political subject, um, and, and it was even in question, could, could uh, the working class topple Temer uh, to the point where we're at now, which is ex a very, uh, a pretty right-wing and reactionary situation, um, like how did this, how could this have happened? And so I think on one hand, it's important to point to the role of imperialist interests um, that, you know, as the global economic crisis deepens, imperialists are quick uh, to put the semi-colonies sort of back in their place, so to speak, right? Uh, they, you know, before they demand, you know, Brazil has to hand over some of the pre-salt oil. Now, now they want all of it. Um, you know, now it, it's privatization. Um, so I think it's when we talk about the tasks of the left, I think it's central to have an anti-imperialist stance. And it's central uh, in Brazil to have an anti-imperialist stance and in the US to understand anti-imperialism uh, not just as you know, being against the border wall, which we are against, <laughs> being against you know, bombs in the Middle East, uh, but also uh, this, the, this kind of imperialism when we're talking about uh, corporations uh, from the US in particular. Um, and then I think that the other important lesson is that um, is about the workers' party and this this uh, this idea of class conciliation, uh, the idea that you can fight the right uh, via elections. Uh, and it, you know we see we saw how at every step of the way uh, the working class it was willing to fight, and the workers' party and the union bureaucrats uh, who are with the workers' party absolutely refuse. Uh, to, to fight. Um, they, they would rather uh, Juma get impeached than organize a strike. They would rather Lula be in jail than organize a strike. Um, and, and absolutely, um, it, it, things could turn out differently if, uh, if, if, the, the worker, if the working class were, uh, were put in motion. And, so I think that, and then we think about you know the left, the worker, you know the workers' party is a capitalist party, but um, 
you know, unfortunately in Brazil, the, the largest left party is the PSOL, the Party of Socialism and Liberty, which is uh, a sort of broad party. Um, and they have recently entered into a coalition with the PT. Um, and, and, uh, and again, uh, thinking that you, know, you, that you give up class conciliation in order to, f you, give up, uh, you give up class independence in order to fight the right, that you need to be, that you need to be united with the PT in, in order to fight uh, the, the right. And I think that uh, we've seen uh, that that absolutely is a dead end, that the Workers' Party absolutely doesn't, doesn't, want, to, uh, doesn't want to put up and fight. And in fact, that the Workers' Party uh, opened the way for the advance of the right. You know, uh, Temer, Michel Temer became vice president because Juma put him there, right? Um, and, and it's a right, that, right wing that the Workers' Party entered into coalition with in order to stay in the government the entire time. Um, and so I think that it goes, you know, sort of uh, beyond that they don't want to fight. It's that the, the Workers' Party actually opened the doors to, to the rise of the right. And so uh, I think what's important is, as we talk about takeaways, and I'm going to wrap up here, is that uh, there is, in fact, a political polarization, one that the right wing has capitalized on and, ex and, and expanded upon, but that uh, there is a necessity for a real left political alternative. And if there was one, uh, the story could be much different. Um, because uh, there was a real left political force in the working class that could organize the working class to, to, to fight against the right wing, um, not relying on elections, not relying, not you know, placing their faith in the courts. Because when Lula got arrested, he, you know, there were people that didn't want him to give himself up to go to jail. And he said, no, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to I'm gonna go turn myself in and prove my innocence. And it's like, prove your innocence? Like, it's so clearly a sham. It's so clearly that the, the courts are, con are controlled by right-wing sectors uh, that, that, um, that are, are putting you in prison absolutely for political reasons. And so, you know, really the need for uh, an alternative that uses the strength of the working class um, is, is absolutely what, what is needed in Brazil um, in order to, to fight the advance of the right wing. And, uh, and I think, like I said, and I think that that is possible because I think that the, the situation now is characterized not by just a march of the right, but rather by a polarization and a complete uh, lack in, in the left of, of uh, being able to, uh, to organize the working class to confront the the terrible measures of the right. So I'm going to end there, um, and Hima is going to talk, and then afterwards we'll take questions. Uh, first of all, thanks to Left Boys for the invitation. Second, regarding to something that Tatiana says, said, uh, you, you don't have Messi, do you? <laughs> I don't know. Well, perhaps we can talk about that later. <laughs> uh, We're going through a bad moment in Brazil. <laughs> bad moment. Well, uh, I'm going to read the exposition because my English is not good enough, so sorry for that. Uh, I want to raise three points that I find important regarding the title of the panel, the task of the left in Latin America after the being tied. The first refers to, the, to a question across the social democratic wings and even certain leftist wings, and that is the next, what happened in Latin America? Uh, how could it be that five years ago we had the PT in Brazil, uh, the Kirchnerism in Argentina, Bachelet in Chile, Chavez in Venezuela, and today we have Temer, Macri, Piñera, and a deep crisis in Maduro's Venezuela. I would like to answer that question for what concerns Argentina by reconstructing what, uh, what Kirchnerism was, because I think that it helps to think what the big governments were. The second point has to do uh, with what we might call an Argentine anomaly, uh, and that refers to the role of the far left in my country, in our country, particularly the Trotskyist tradition expressed in the French law, in the left front. I don't know if you know, uh, the left front is an electoral front conformed by three different parties, the three parties uh, uh, are Trotskyists, uh, the PTS, the PO, and IS. 
uh, and the front loft, uh, the front, uh, sorry, the left front has an electoral space at national level of six percent, and with uh, a rise to fifteen percent um, in some counties uh, as Mendoza or Salta. Yeah. The third point uh, refers to the current situation in Argentina and how to build united fronts to fight against right-wing governments without implying strengthening the political parties whose policies are responsible for us being in this situation. So I'm referring to Kirchnerism in Argentina, but perhaps you can think in Democrat Party here. In other words, how to fight together against attacks on the labor movement, on democratic rights, on the rights of minorities, on social movements, and so on, without that meaning work for them, for that parties. Yeah? Well, let's start with the first point. What was Kirchnerism? If you allow me to do a bit of history, Kirchnerism was the product of an organic crisis in Argentina, using Gramsci's terminology. It was the, the 2001 crisis. Uh, and that, that crisis was the result of the counter-reforms of the neoliberalism in Argentina. So uh, in that sense, the, the 2001 crisis is absolutely topically, topical sorry, in this context of neoliberal counter-reforms at the regional and global level. Let me say some few things about the 2001 crisis. At social le uh, economic level, there are some similar things uh, what happens now in Greece, for example, 25% of unemployment, 50% of poverty level, lowest historical level of unionization, lowest historical floor of real salary in the country, the retirement and the pension system privatized and collapsed, um, crisis in the public education and the public health, external debt crisis. Yes, it's typical <laughs> neoliberal crisis. The main response of the class struggle to this crisis was the emergence of a strong movement of the unemployed workers called the Piquetero movement, yeah? And the workers managed factories movement as Sanon. I don't know if you know, I'm going to talk about Sanon later. Uh, there is, uh, this is an important thing because these two workers' movements were also expression of policy neglect and cooperation of the union bureaucracy. So these two movements, on one hand, shows the, the, the strength of the working class, creating his own, his, uh, its own movements. But on the other hand, it shows its weaknesses, its weakness, because the union bureaucracy uh, politics. Um, there are some uh, economic, well, in fact, Kirchnerism was the response to that crisis, yes? And, and in a sense, and there's a very, a very uh, interesting debate in Argentina about that, uh, the main task or the main goal of Kirchnerism, Kirchnerism was uh, to rebuild the institutions of the regime. And in, in, in a sense, they did. Uh, well, there are some economic bases that made the Kirchnerism possible. First, the devaluation of 30% of the value of the Argentine currency that depressed the value of the labor at the international level. Second, the growth of international prices that, uh, of what Argentine exports to the world, basically agro-products. Uh, this combination generates a period of non-interrupted uh, economic growth until 2008, uh, something known as growth at Chinese, uh, as, uh, at Chinese, 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 Chinese rates. <laughs> well, uh, standing on that economic situation, Kirchner government had a policy that could be summarized as employment growth while maintaining the precarious labor conditions that the neoliberalism lead. And this is very important because some things I, I want to point out here. Uh, first, uh, unemployment rate falls from 25% to less than 10% during the, the Kirchner uh, government, but shop insecurity maintains its neoliberal rates, temporary contracts, outsourcing or in companies, unregistered shop, etc. The real wage growth, but never broke the salary ceiling of the 90s. 
So after 15 years of Kirchnerism, the real wage in Argentina average was at the same levels at the end of the, of the 90s, of the worst decade of neoliberalism. Union activity improved without changing the unionism rate that remained at the levels around 37%, that it's the level of the 90s. I know you are thinking that this rate is very high, Yes, and, it's, and, it, and it is <laughs> compared with the 11% in the United States. But compared with the 65% that Argentina had in mid-80s, it's very low. Uh, the, for example, uh, Tatiana was talking about the privatization of the, of, uh, the public uh, utilities. During the, the Kirchner government, the, the public utilities uh, maintained uh, in a private sector. So there was not a renationalization of the private uh, utilities. And the last point is the payment of high percentage of Argentine's external debt, recognizing its legitimacy as the mechanism of national subordination. Even in 2014, a new indebtedness with the Paris Club that implied a new devaluation carried out by Cristina Fernández de Kirchner. So, I want to notice these five policies for two reasons. The first, maintaining the neoliberalism uh, rules of the game is very important because it explains to some extent uh, that those same rules and, uh, are operating today under right-wing government like Macri. Yes. The second, because these five points involved a political struggle between the left, the far left, and the Kirchnerism, in which the left denounced, we denounced, the Kirchner government for maintaining the conditions inherited from the 90s and fought against that state policies seen our insertion in the insertion in the labor movement and in social movements. This is very important because the, during Kirchnerism this requirement and confronting the government policies was accused of being utopian or of being non-reasonable. Uh, even the Far West was accused of playing in the hands of the right wing for criticizing. Uh, in short, Kirchnerism was presented as the realistic policy versus the unrealist unrealistic policy of the Far Left. Well, 15 years after that, now we can see that what plays into the hands of the right is precisely not to carry out more radical politis, mes, uh, political measures, because that leaves the ground prepared for the return of the, of the right-wing parties, as we can see now in Argentina. Unfortunately, as the uh, history of the class struggle shows, and as Marx understood two years, two, 200 years ago, uh, what is shown is as completely utopian is the idea of a human capitalism. Uh, the recent history in Latin America leaves the balance of teaching that French workers and students were not so wrong 50 years ago when they wrote on the walls, let's be realistic, let's ask for the impossible. I don't know the, the, the good translation of that, but it's a beautiful phrase, <laughs> you know. Well, uh, the second point to which I want to refer is what I call the Argentine anomaly, to refer the weight that the radical, the Marxist, and particular Trotskyist left has in the country. The first thing uh, uh, to say is that it would be really a big mistake, an important mistake, to consider that this weight has, was ob obtained electorally. Yes? On the contrary, the electoral space of the left front in Argentina expresses a concrete place in class struggle. That is the first that, that is the dynamic, and it is this dynamic that is playing the permanence and, uh, and the growth of the left front uh, in the electoral arena. The fact, for example, that Miriam Bregman, Nicolás del Caño are prominent political features, figures in, in Argentina responds to the organic relationship between the left legislator and the class struggles. Uh, and that organic relationship was not built on the electoral terrain from 2011 onwards. 2011, it was the year that the friend love was uh, the, the left from was uh, conformed. Uh, the far left um, was built uh, in the last two decades of class struggle in the country. The far left has a political weight 
uh, that have been in the five most popular moment, movements in the country in recent decades. I want to just to, to say th these five moments. The first place, the picotero movement, the unemployed movement, yes, and the workers' management uh, factories movement that emerged in the crisis of 2001. Uh, I will give a concrete example that I think uh, you perhaps know. It's a known factory, which is an international example of workers' self-management studied around the world and one on which Naomi Klein has made an interesting documentary. You can find it in YouTube. Um, one of the things that was always differentiated Sanon from the other experiences of workers' management factories was that Sanon never fought only for Sanon. Its policy was always to transform the factory into a point of support of other struggles, such as the Mapuche community uh, in the south of the country, other factories in the area, the human rights movement, etc. So, and, and Sanon's experience cannot be explained without the active participation of the far left particularly the PTS, at the union at the shop floor. The most important Sanon's leader, Raúl Godoy, is currently a left from deputy from Neuquel County. And, uh, well, I don't know how many labor deputies do you know. Uh, it's, uh, well, Ra uh, Raúl Godoy is a labor and Marxist deputy, and it's a strange uh, thing, even in the left. And I think that this, his figure expresses what we can call something like a, a re revolutionary parliamentarism. That is, the legislative offices as a way of uh, strengthening, to strengthen the struggle of the working class and popular sectors. Uh, the second movement uh, is the so-called grassroots trade unionism that takes place in Argentina from 2004 onwards. The far left has been a part of the main workers' struggle of the Kirchner period, not only against the company, but also against the Peronist union bureaucracy. You know, the Peronism in Argentina is like a so-called wo uh, working class sentiment, something like that. So that is... Um, that implies that, that there is a generation, uh, uh, it's very important for me this, um, there is an, a generation of workers for whom the far left is part of their experience as a class, is part of their struggles, of some victories and also of defeats, and of the conclusions that are drawn from those defeats. Our welcome militancy in the workplace, our permanent differentiation from the Peronist bureaucracy have impacted on the sector, on a, on a sector of workers, particularly new generation of workers, who are now voting uh, to, the, to the left front, but also those uh, who are active supporters of the left front. Uh, for example, uh, one of the most interesting things in the, in the last uh, ele electoral campaign was the workers' candidacies. Uh, that is the proposal that the workers present themselves as candidates for legislative uh, office. Uh, and that is very important be, uh, because it goes against a common sense that is widespread even on the left. The separation between union work and electoral work. Yes. And, and, and this separation makes uh, trade union work become unionistic and electoral work become ele electoralistic. And I think, I believe that the efforts uh, to make, to articulate the union work with electoral work have a very important, uh, it's very important because it, it is a concrete way, concrete way of pointing out a basic Marxist budget, the working class as a political agent. Uh, that basic Marxist idea is absolutely revolutionary today in the vast majority of the left. Uh, the third movement is the human rights movement in Argentina. You know, Argentina has a very strong tradition of fighting against the military con uh, dictator dictatorship, dictatorship in the 70s. Um, that movement has a broad political spectrum from the social democrats to the Marxist left. We are part of the movement, building a left wing which is win with its own policy. For example, considering that the human rights are not reduced 
to the struggle for the past, but to the current defense of workers, women, uh, the fight against the police harassment uh, to poor youth in the neighborhoods, etc. That is to say, to conceive the struggle for, uh, for human rights as an anti-capitalist struggle. Uh, Miriam Bregman, deputy of front defender uh, of the PTS in the front, uh, the left front, uh, is is a undisputed referent of the human rights in in, in Argentina, and I, and the, you cannot separate uh, her figure as a fighter of her figure as a deputy, and I think that's a very very important thing. Can you repeat the name? Miriam Bregman. I'm a teacher. Sorry. Sorry for that. I cannot. That's the name. No, thank you for asking. So, um, the other moment, social moment, is the student moment in Argentina. We had a, a long tradition of a student movement in Argentina. In fact, this year, it, uh, 100 years have passed since the so-called university reform in our country, in which the students won the tripartite government of the university. That is a co-government among professors, graduates, and students. I know you, uh, from your point of view, uh, of view this tripartite government is a huge achievement, and it is, but we need today a second university reform to democratize a, a, um, a university that is becoming increasingly commodified and becomes a hunting ground for private sector interests. And in that sense, in the, uh, on, the, on that road of democratization, we were part of a process, very, very uh, anomaly too, a process uh, in which for the first time in history of the University of Buenos Aires, a department director, the sociology department, was uh, chosen by direct vote of the students. Yes, uh, that was driven by the left, but uh, the, the the left front, the PTS in the left, and the director elected was Christian Castillo, is a member of the PTS. It was deputy uh, till I think 2014, uh, and and this process led to a reform a reform of electoral regime in the Faculty of Social Sciences, which, while still having very anti-democratic <laughs> elements, was an advance for the students and their rights to be political agents in the university. Finally, I want to talk just a minute about the women's uh, movement in Argentina. I don't know if you know, but the, the women's movement in Argentina was one of the uh, who promoted the current uh, women's international strike with Poland for example, uh, and the intersection, you know, between feminism and Marxism has not been simple at all, and nor, and nor is it uh, resolved. There are no recipes once and for all. However, there, the search for a socialist feminism is a, a sine qua non condition for a left that is supposed to be revo revolutionary now. In that sense, we, we, we found it in 2000, a, a group, a, a woman movement called Pan y Rosas, or Bread and Roses, yes, of Bread course, roses. of course. Uh, that that it's part it's, it's one of the of the more important the largest uh, women's group in the country, and 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 it's part in this moment of this revival of the woman uh, movement with a with a socialist perspective, so it's important to be there too. In short, what I want to point out is that this anomaly for a far left in Argentina cannot be understood without the organic insertion of the far left in the struggles and organizations that the working class, the students, the popular sectors produced in the country in recent decades. An insertion that Im involved being an organic part of these movements, but building in each of them an anti-capitalist wing. On each of these movements, we are what we might call a differentiated part. This di dialectic between being an organic part and at the same time as distinguished 
ourselves, yourself, and trying to propose anti-capitalist policies, I think is the basis on which the political electoral space of the FIT has in Argentina is based. Uh, any political electoral space is weak or is fleeting, a fleeting moment if it is not based on this placement in living working classes movement. And finally, a few words about the current situation and the challenges we have from the left today in Argentina. We are living through a period, a transition period, yes. We are not in the situation of stability of the Kirchnerism, the, the, burg the, the bourgeois uh, is attacking the working class and the popular sectors once again. But, but, and this is very important, this new attack finds a working class and popular sector that I, I said before, accumulated a strong experience in its struggle and organization in recent years. That experience has not been erased. The massive marches in December 2017 against the pension reform marked a stop for the counter-reforms of the Macri government and reminded the government that to implement that, counter, that, that kind of counter-reforms, uh, it is necessary to re defeat the popular movement in the streets, in the factories, in the universities. But that mobilization also reminded me to, uh, this to the Peronist party and to union bureaucracy. Thousands of workers, young people, precarious workers, march despite the, ref the refusal of their unions to mobilize. Uh, at the same time, the presence of the left uh, was very important in that uh, struggles and mobilization. So, the first conclusion is that this new situation is not yet defined. It may imply a new defeat, for the working class, or it may also mean a turn to a situation of greater class struggle and social convulsions. Second conclusion, the definition of this period of transition is in the class struggle and not in the polls. In the polls. The polls can be a support or an obstacle of resistance or to resistance, but they cannot supplant this resistance in the struggle. Third conclusion, if the union's leadership had the policy on facing these new cuts, the situation would be different. What would happen, have happened if in December the this union confederation had called to a general strike? Was, it would be very, very different the situation. So if anybody has doubts about whether the fight against the union bureaucracy is a current and important struggle, well, if you see Argentina, you will be com convinced of that. Uh, in that sense, uh, this is a moment of great importance and a test for the revolutionary left in Argentina because uh, unlike what happened in the last crisis in 2001, the radical left comes with a concrete place in the labor movement, in the main social movements of the country and also in the electoral field. So the first challenge is to deepen that space because what we have is not enough. We need to forge a generation of Marxist workers, women, young people who embrace the ideas of the social revolution. And we need to do this at the international level because the crisis is at that level. The second challenge is that the policy of ally or alliances that we carry out to face the right wing, that is the united front that is absolutely necessary we build. The united front cannot mean the politics of the lesser evil or the alliance with the sectors such Peronism in Argentina or perhaps you can think in the Democrat Party here, that sectors that were part of the problem of the problem and not of the solution. It implies a greatest breadth to add wills to resist attacks from the right wing, combined with the ability to present ourselves as a class and anti-capitalist political alternative. This capacity requires a deep insertion in the working class and popular movements, a deep creativity to update Marxism as a strategic practice of social revolution. That is PTS bed inside the left front. Thank you very much. My name is Jimena. I'm going to read because my English is not well enough. I uh, hope this is not being boring for you all. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to talk about Mexico, uh, which is far from Brazil and Argentina, not just 
geographically, but politically. Um, uh, yeah, and that's because our proximity with U the U.S. imperialism. <laughs> so, okay, as you know, the integration of Mexico into, into the U.S. economy is absolute. It is not, of course, a relationship between two equal partners, uh, but rather a total subordination uh, of, Mex of Mexico to its northern neighbor that has completely modified the Mexican social structure over the last 30 years. Um, both the Republican and the Democratic uh, presidencies um, have faithfully represented the imperialist interest on Mexico. Um, so, with the arrival of Donald Trump in the White House, the relationship between Mexico and the United States is now in a critical phase, as you probably know. Uh, in the discourse of Trump, Mexico symbolizes the source of many of problems of the United States. Um, the racist and xenophobic rhetoric of the current president and his attempt to hold Mexico and Mexican migrants responsible for the dire situation facing millions of American workers aim to obscure the truth. And the truth is that the great winners of the NAFTA and the bilateral relationship have been the ruling classes of both countries. So both the big American bourgeoisie and the Mexican bourgeoisie have made billions in profits through NAFTA. Uh, they are profits stained by blood uh, because behind the economic relations and the br uh, are the brutal I'm sorry are the brutal manifestations of imperialist penetration in Mexico. Uh, the war on drugs, the militarization of the country, especially the border zone, and the emergency of all types of illegal businesses that operate in the margins of the Mexican state uh, to meet the demands of American consumption. consumption. So in the context of a major political, economic, and social crisis, the upcoming presidential elections in Mexico are a potential source of great instability for the bilateral relationship. The mainstream parties, uh, who all promoted NAFTA, of course, and the neoliber neoliberal offensive, are today absolutely discredited in Mexico. So this is the case of the Institutional Revolutionary Party, known as the PRI, uh, the National Action Party, uh, or PAN, and the Party of the Democratic Revolution, or PRD. Uh, the candidate who currently leads the polls by a 20-point margin is Andrés Manuel López Obrador, uh, the left center candidate of the National Regener Regeneration Movement, known as Morena, uh, who has been cheated through fraud in the last two presidential elections. Um, it is the first time in more than 75 years that a candidate identified with the left in Mexico has real chances of winning the presidency. Um, so this sudden change in the consciousness of the masses cannot be understood without analyzing the terrible consequences that the economic policy of the Mexican ruling class, mandated by the United States government, has had in the social life of the country. So in this presentation, I'm, I, I will try to summarize of the, the, the most acute problems of imperialist penetration in Mexico, and then I will address some aspects of the current political reality and the next presidential election. Okay, so first of all, um, as you know, Mexico shares close to 2,000 miles of border with the United States. Uh, we have a saying that goes, uh, poor Mexico, so, f so far from God and so close to the United States. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, U.S. intervention in Mexico has been a phenomenon since the 19th century, but yeah. it has accelerated in the past 25 years. So on January 1st, as you probably know, 1994, the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, was put into effect. At the same time, uh, the Zapatista Rebellion broke out in the south of the country with the slogans, Abajo el mal gobierno, or Down with the bad government, and Stop NAFTA. Um, the implementation of NAFTA began an economic, an economic cycle in Mexico that is now in crisis, not only because of the economic collapse of 2008, but also because uh, of the rise of the Donald Trump, okay? So 
the thing is Mexico exports labor, raw materials, and narcotics to its northern neighbor, while the United States invest a massive amount of capital in Mexico, which gave birth to the Maquiladora Corridor along the northern border and the new industry in Mexico, the mining industry, the oil industry, and agricultural businesses all depend on this capital. And the U.S. has given life to legal and illegal tourism industries, such as trafficking, both organ trafficking and human trafficking. Um, goods, capital, and people are constantly crossing the border, both legally and illegally. Uh, and this constant flux gives illegal economic sectors unique characteristics. Specifically, the U.S. demand for immigrant labor, sex trafficking, and drugs has created an economic niche that exists on the margins of the state, but at the same time is directly supported by the state. I'm sure you are familiar with the concept narco state in Mexico, okay? Um, so organized crime uses paramilitary groups to defend their market, and at the same time, in association with the state, carries out brutal violence against the poor and the working class. An infamous example of this was the murder and torture of 100 migrants in Tamaulipas in 2013 in hands of the drug cartels because they refused to uh, join the cartel. Uh, other victims of organized crime include those who stand in political opposition, like the 43 students of Ayotzinapa that was <coughs> disappeared exactly in 2014. So, their role, they role as privileged distributors of cocaine and amphetamines to the United States has conferred exorbitant power on Mexican cartels. And they now operate as large global capitalist the, uh, corporations in several countries. Ultimately, the market of narcotics, um, the market for narcotics and other illegal industries quickly generates a massive amount of capital, which is then put into circulation through money laundering. So the response of the Mexican and US government to the growth of, the, of drug trafficking uh, was militarization, as you know, which only increased the violence. Um, the Merida Plan is a security agreement that the Mexican government and the American government signed to give a legal framework uh, to American military intervention in Mexican territory. Um, the so-called war on drugs that been waged against Mexico for more than 10 years uh, was, manda was manda mandated uh, by the White House under destruction and operation of US intelligence agencies and the armed forces. The results have been devastating. Uh, even the most conservative figures estimate uh, 106,000 people have been killed. No, 160,000 160, have been killed. Um, 25 million have been displaced. And anywhere from uh, 20, 25,000 to 45,000 have gone missing. So who furnishes the arms in the war against drug trafficking, the US. Mm -hmm. But in particular, President Trump wants to put even more restrictions on migration from Mexico, but at the same time, he wants to export high-tech weapons without any restrictions. This is uh, the, one, the, one of the terrible and criminal aspect of capitalist system. Uh, people is not free to move, <laughs> but weapons, it's yeah. very easy, right? Mm -hmm. So as The Intercept reported in April, senior representative of the arms industry in the United States met with the president to agree on how to increase their profits. Um, they had come together as part of the Defense Trade Advisory Group, which advises the State Department about how to make it easier to export weapons around the world. On the agenda for the day was a proposal for something called batch filling. Uh, which would allow weapons companies to submit multiple applications for export licenses at a time. And of course, many of the companies present had a particularly large stake in Mexico. There were representatives from Lockheed Martin, which sends Black Hawk helicopters to Mexico, and from Textron, which owns Bell helicopters, also purchased by Mexico military. And there was represent a representative from Namotali, uh, from which the Mexican military bought more than 2,000 weapons in 2016 for a little over 8 million. So the victims of the militarization and this uh, uh, policy 
um, and of course, the exportation of American weapons to Mexico are the workers, the poor, the peasants, and indigenous people, and they also face the increasingly militarization of the border. So as you know, uh, or probably you, not, you don't know, but the night of October 10, 2012, a Customs and Border Patrol agent shot and stuck a 16-year-old Jose Antonio Elena Rodriguez 10 times along the Nogales portion of the Arizona-Mexico border. His body was found on a sidewalk in Mexico, not far from the border fence. <coughs> and we recently learned of the criminal murder of the young Guatemalan woman, Claudia Patricia Gomez, at the hands of the Border Patrol. Uh, the death of Jose Antonio and Claudia Patricia was not accidental. Uh, this tragedy was the result of border control policies that used increase to deter migrants from entering the United States. The systematic intensification of the border security system, which transforms international borders into zones of permanent vigilance, enforcement, and violence, uh, to quote the National Network for Immigrant and Refugee Rights. So in 1994, President, this is not, uh, uh, and this militarization is not uh, just a policy framed by Trump or the Republican Party. It's also part of the uh, uh, Republican Party agenda. In 1994, President Bill Clinton launched Operation Gatekeeper, a project whose state aim was the, to restore integrity and safety to the nation's busiest border, the San Diego-Tijuana border. The policy increased the budget for the U.S. border patrol and doubled the amount of fencing along the border. In 2006, George W. Bush allocated funds for 700 miles of fencing and surveillance technology along the border through the Secure Fence Act, including cameras, a, a sensor, lighting, whatever. Under the Obama administration, resources for border security reached their highest level and the border fence was doubled. So the increasing allocation of funds of border security on the U.S.-Mexico border is likely to continue to grow as politicians continue to mobilize the threat of criminal activity and terrorism toward the, uh, this end. Not, so, not surprisingly, border security is a key issue um, on the Trump's agenda. Um, okay, uh, and also the background of this situation uh, was, of course, the, 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 the change in the, in the Mexican economics because of NAFTA, okay? As you know, probably you know, uh, with NAFTA, the Mexican economy developed a manufacturing industry that was entirely dependent on transnational corporations. So the massive foreign direct investment attracts capital due to both a very low cost labor force, even in comparison to Chinese salary levels. That's why Mexico sometimes is called like uh, the Western China, um, and the country's proximity to the United States. I mean, it's very easy because we are neighbors. So uh, despite what Donald Trump claims, NAFTA has created immense profits for U.S. transnational capital, not only by creating low-cost goods uh, for U.S. consumption, but also by opening Mexico to subsidize American products. The most emblematic example is corn, which is the basis of the Mexican diet, and makes up 6% of national agricultural production. So with NAFTA, the government authorized the entry of two um, and a half million metric tons of duty-free corn. The Mexican corn industry was left with no possibility of competing with corn imported from the United States because agricultural productivity in the U.S. is so much higher than that of Mexico. So the peasant organization report that the U.S. government subsidizes corn at 10 percent of production cost, while in Mexican government, while Mexican government, I'm sorry, subsidies do not even reach 9 percent. Corn is perhaps the most glaring example of this dynamic, uh, which has left rural farmers and peasants in complete ruin in Mexico, and has led to around 3,000. 3, 300,000 people, 300, I'm sorry, <laughs> a year migrating to industrialized cities of the United, to the industrialized cities in Mexico or the United States. So these immigrants from the countryside make up the new Mexican working class who sell their labor for pennies and create low cost products for the U.S. Um, and here in the U.S. we are like second category citizenships. Yeah. So. What's going on right now? <laughs> uh, the situation is very dynamic. <laughs> uh, 
because within this context of the unique imperialist relationship between the US and Mexico, it should be noted that democratic rights are weak in Mexico, as you know. So Obrador, Andrés Manuel López Obrador, has already faced two elections a visit with fraud, and it's likely he will face more fraud in the coming weeks. We don't know, we will see. Uh, it seems difficult because he's uh, leading the polls. But against the fraud, of course, we support the democratic right of the people to fair elections, okay? That said, uh, as socialists, as communists, we struggle for class independence, and in this case, we oppose Morena as a left nationalist bourgeois party. Uh, because we think we must build our own uh, uh, political uh, revolutionary party. The history of the Mexican left demands we learn this lesson. Why? In the first place, the example of the PRI is a demonstration of the failure of the left to maintain class independence. Okay? It began as the left bourgeois element of the Mexican Revolution, and they butchered the left-wing leadership of the working class and peasant revolutionary armies incarnate by Zapata and Pancho Villa. And they then have led the country for 80 years through repression, of course, and other methods of a soft dictatorship. And today they remain an authoritarian party that brutalizes the working class. And this is done both through violence, but also in the leadership of the, deca of the decades long neoliberal offensive of the country. But they could not rule this way indefinitely, okay? Things are changing because the working class and the people in Mexico are pissed off. I'm sorry. Um, so the working class and the press got fed up. The democratic transition of 2000, it was a response uh, to workers' struggle and popular discontent with the pre-government. And this discontent emerged in, in, the, in the last years of the 80s against the anti-democratic maneuvers of the governing regime and was manifested in the explosion of the Zapatista movement in Chiapas, of course. But the goal of the trans transition was to divert the growing anger and the nascent, and, and the nascent social movement. I mean, the, the transition was made and mandat mandated by US imperialists to obstacle the possibility that the pre-regime was defeated by class struggle. Uh, with a class independence perspective. So against these, demos, the, uh, against these democratic slogans of the pre, against this um, apparently democratic change lead apparently by the pre, uh, um, uh, yeah. a change that was, was mandated by the US imperialists, we are opposed and we continue to fight for the democratic demands of the working class and the people, of course, but not as a stale uh, breadcrumbs given out by the regime, but as a never sufficient concessions forced on, on the capitalists through mass struggle and militancy. So even the left bourgeoisie understands the limitation of the democratic transition. It was a failure. Uh, popular support for Morena in this election demonstrates the bankruptcy of the transition. At the same time, it puts the workers and popular movement in a new dilemma. Should we trust the parties that call to reform the Mexican regime? Is the Mexican regime reformable without a, an acute class struggle or actually a revolution? The same parties that led the democratic transition in the first place? Or should we build a political alternative based on the exploited and the oppressed? So from my organization, we're a small organization in comparison with what, what it Mex Mexico is. You know, Mexico is a big country. But we believe that two tasks of this political alternative, two, two urgent tasks to build an independent political alternative uh, would have to be the renationalization of, of Pemex, Petróleos Mexicanos, and the non-payment of foreign debt. Um, I'm going to explain, OK? But, but this urgent task threatened two structural aspects of the imperialist domination over Mexico, OK? The imperialist control over oil and the economic restraint of Mexico to, to the United States through the millionaire external debt. Uh, Petróleos Mexicanos, the Mexican Petrobras, <laughs> every, uh, um, there's always oil involved, right? <laughs> the, so Petróleos Mexicanos was nation nationalized by Lázaro Cárdenas in 1938 as a result of the massive nine-month strike and reprivatized re by Enrique Peña Nieto in 2012. And the amount of the Mexican foreign debt 
whose main creditor is the United States, is calculated in 480 billions. Okay? So, given the special relationship of U.S. imperialists and Mexico, this puts special demands on the U.S. left and the working class. I think so. The workers in the U.S. must fight for open borders, of course, and full citizenship rights for people who live here, of course. It is true. But most of all, uh, um, but must also fight, I'm sorry, the U.S. government against all imperialist intervention in Mexico, which has caused misery and oppression for millions. On the other hand, we believe that it's urgent to build a revolutionary organization in Mexico that break this, the, the lack of class independency, which is a tragedy for the left in Mexico, and we need to build a revolutionary organization to prepare ourselves to the second Mexican revolution uh, 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 in the future. So, while the ruling class of our respective countries share common interest and live thanks to the work of millions of workers that today make, that, that today make up the NAFTA economy. Um, I think we, the workers and people from Mexico and the US, share a history of exploitation and oppression that comes from the same bosses and those that govern a, a, us decades ago. So I think it's time to identify our common enemies, the capitalists and their political parties, and fight side by side with our class, class brothers. Thank you. but there's a lot of other landless movements. And um, if you know anything about the indigenous people struggle over this, these, this law in the Congress to um, uh, change abilities to demarcate uh, indigenous people's territories, um, if you can say anything about that and how that's playing into your broader struggle of you or your party and result. Oh, yes, uh, Jimena, so uh, is your organization calling for a boycott of a vote for AMLO, or what is, what is their stance? And, and it, what is the stance of, you said the United Left? <coughs> what is their stance? Is it boycott? Uh, or what? Because the, the vote's July 1st. Yeah. Um, I have a couple of different questions. One of them is that um, you mentioned that you thought that people in Brazil should be anti-imperialist, but you didn't say anything about anti-capitalism. And I'm wondering, is that an oversight? Or, uh, there are a couple yes, of things. Yes, they should be anti-capitalist. <laughs> uh, the, the truckers just shut down Brazil. And I'm yeah. just wondering, I know they have sort of a mixed status there, sort of private contractors and not. And I'm wondering what's going on with that. I, I know that there are people, there's an organization called Con, Con Mudis, which is, which is run by a steel worker who's a communist. And I'm wondering what role does he play and how large is this organization? And the other question I wanted to ask for you about Argentina, I have a friend in Argentina, so we speak every like, once a week. And I don't know whether I missed it, but she's always reporting on major demonstrations of hundreds of thousands of people, especially in Buenos Aires. And I don't know that you talked about it, and I'm wondering if you could fill that in a little bit about what's going on. I know that there are different unions that are, some of them are pro, you know, the government, some of them are anti, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the differences are and who's in what and, <coughs> and what impact that's making. Okay. Um, okay, we're going to take these three and then the other three. Is that correct? And we can answer now? Yes. 
Okay, so first of all, yes, socialism, anti-capitalism, yes, <laughs> absolutely. So, total, yeah, if that wasn't clear, socialist revolution, <laughs> right. Okay, so uh, there. Um, no, okay, so the, the trucker strike is actually, or trucker's mobilization is actually, uh, it's difficult and, and, and contradictory, I think, uh, because it, at first, it seems like, oh, hey, these truckers are, you know, stopping roads, and that's great, and it sort of, that was my first impression. And then it was like, okay, but wait a minute. So Bolsonaro, who is, you know, Brazil's Donald Trump, right wing of the right wing of the right wing, comes out and is like, we are all truckers. And I was like, oh, man. <laughs> okay. So, um, so for one thing. And then, then we look at their demands, right? And so also, and, and looking at who, who they are. So they're mostly uh, small business owners, right? They, they own several different trucks and they drive them and uh, transport things from one place to another. And, and, and what they're asking for is subsidies from the government for diesel, right? And so they're not asking for higher wages, they're not asking for lower gas prices for the population as a whole, they're asking for subsidies from the government for diesel, which is the for the trucks that they drive. Um, and we also saw that a, sect, a, a large sector of these work, uh, of the truckers are calling for uh, support for, uh, for Bolsonaro, and they are also, um, you know, even a sector of them talking about, you know, bringing back the military dictatorship. So uh, to me, given those characteristics, uh, we can't characterize it as, you know, like a workers' strike or the same way we would characterize Petrobras strike, right? The Petrobras strike is, well, it's a political strike against privatization. And so I think that, that you know, this, these trucker strikes are, are, are actually, I think, pretty reactionary. Um, and, and, it, and, and I think it's important to, to characterize them beyond sort of the combative stance that, that they seem to be taking. Um, so that's about the trucker strike about Conlutas. So Conlutas uh, is a, yeah, it's a group of different labor unions and organizations. Uh, the, in the leadership of Conlutas is the PSTU, uh, which is the uh, Moreno party in, in Brazil. Um, and uh, the, the group that I uh, was part of when I lived in Brazil, the MRT, we participated in Conlutas. Um, because absolutely we, you know, support uh, building uh, a socialist left in the labor movement and Conlutas uh, in that way could, could help in, in that sense and organize the working class in that way. Um, the, the thing that is uh, unfortunate, <laughs> I guess, is that uh, the PSTU had uh, a pretty poor position, in my opinion, in, in relation to the soft coup. Uh, they, uh, they, in, in some way, they said, you know, they, they supported the coup. They said that, that, that you know, it was progressive, that, that Juma was ousted, and that, in fact, they should oust all of the politicians and that this could go in that direction. So their slogan was, uh, fora todos, out with all of them. Um, and so, to me, it was a misreading of, uh, of you know, the subject that was doing the ousting, right? It'd be one thing if the working class organized was ousting the, the president, it would be another, I mean, it's another thing if, you know, these sectors uh, of the right wing and uh, imperialist interests are supporting uh, the ousting. So uh, that's, to me, some limits of participating in Gondutas today because it is led by the PSTU. Um, in relation to uh, the MST and in the indigenous movement and all that uh, stuff, um, so the, uh, the MST, the, the Landless Workers Movement, um, also has really combative tactics, right? Uh, blocking roads uh, and, uh, you know, uh, organizing pretty massive mobilizations. They, they organize a lot, a lot of people, um, but have, uh, you know, been pretty uh, sort of subservient and uh, connected to the Workers' Party. And in that sense, uh, that puts real limits on, um, on, on their mobilization. So I know that the MST, when, when Lula was put in jail, they had some mobilizations. Um, but uh, but the, their, their real uh, limits in the sense that, you know, that, that they're connected to, to the PT. And it's also, uh, you know, the PT always promised them land reform. 
You know, that was a big thing that the PT did. They were like, oh, we're going to give land reform, and, and you know, they never did, you know. Um, and so obviously this, uh, this coalition with uh, the PT didn't, didn't work out so great for the MST. So um, I think, uh, yeah, I, to me it would be really important, again, for, uh, for a left, for a socialist organization to have a real program towards, uh, towards the, the, the landless workers, the, the, I guess, peasants, the people who are ruined by these, uh, uh, these large landowners that, that pay uh, pennies to, uh, to peasant workers. Um, in, and it would be really important for socialist organizations to have a real program um, that, that connects the, the cities to, uh, to the workers in rural areas. Um, yeah. Yes, well, I, I think the, the turning point was December 2017 because uh, the government wanted to, do, uh, to make a, um, a pension reform and a labor reform, yes. Everybody was, uh, the, you have in Argentina, you have two uh, types of labor movement. Um, the CGT, Confederación General del Trabajo, uh, it's uh, the traditional Peronist uh, um, labor movement. Uh, and it's, um, it's in the private sector, yes? Um, manufacturing sector, uh, transport, but private sector. In 1993, uh, there's a split of that uh, Confederación General del Trabajo, uh, oh, in Portuguese, uh, um, <laughs> que es uh, CTA, Central de Trabajadores Argentinos, and um, it's in the in the public sector, in the public um, uh, workers and teachers, yes, and nurses, public services and public sector. So um, in this moment, the CCT uh, is uh, uh, is doing absolutely nothing, yes. Uh, that's why in December last year, in December 2017, everybody thought that the labor reform and the pension reform was going to be real, yes. Uh, because everybody knows that the CCT was negotiating with the Macri's government. So uh, that's why the December 2017 is the turning point, because there was a massive mobilization, yes. And in fact, uh, the, mobilization, the mobilization cannot stop the um, pension reform, but stop the labor reform. It was very important. Uh, but, um, and the mobilization was like a attention, a attention called to, to everybody to say, well, well, we are here. We are not defeated. Uh, in this moment, the most important mobilizations uh, are in the public sector. So the CTA is because the cuts are in the public sector too. You know, um, they are uh, they are um, cutting the budget in hospitals, in university. We are in, in now we are like something and a strike in the University of Buenos Aires in all universities. Uh, public, uh, sorry, public universities in Argentina. Uh, so there are a lot of cuts in the, in the, sec in the public sector. So uh, this, the, the CTI is one of the main, um, this, yes, the, the mob, that are more mobilized now. The problem is that there is, a, and there, this is a discussion in this moment in Argentina, that everybody's asking about the general strike. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everybody's asking, what happened? <laughs> why not? Because it's ev everybody's asking, why not general strike? So, and, and well, of course, we are asking uh, 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 for, for that. And, and there is a very interesting, uh, in this moment, experience. You know, the, the, um, the workers of the subway in Argentina had a very strong tradition, uh, a combative tradition. Uh, the, the, this, this sector was one of the first uh, in 2004 uh, that begin that movement of rank and file unionism, uh, revitalization, uh, the last decade, and they are fighting now again. They were repressed. Repressed? Mm -hmm. yes. Yes, yes. They were repressed uh, in the in the strike uh, last week. Uh, so they are one of the uh, sectors that I uh, that are asking for a general strike. Uh, well, let's see, perhaps. Mm -hmm. 
Where she's gonna answer, and then we're gonna get to you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. Uh, yes. We're calling for the blank boat. That makes sense in English, right? Black blank boat as an organization in Mexico, and we'll uh, we also launch our own uh, electoral campaign, uh, contending for a local position in Mexico City. Um, lead by Sulem Estrada. She's a member of our organization and also a teacher. And she was part of the struggle against the education reform. The education reform, as you know, the union teachers in Mexico are very combative. Uh, and yes, she's part of the left opposition against the union bureaucracy inside the union. And now she's contending, contending, contending for, a, for a place in the local Congress in Mexico City. So part of our campaign is try to a frame the class independence necessity of, 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 of the workers, of the left, and, and we're calling for the, for the blank vote. Uh, because I understand a boycott, it's a, it's a method to obstacle the election. Uh, we're not strong in, enough to do that. And also, there's no, uh, uh, all, uh, everyone is going to vote for the lesser evil in this case, <laughs> which is uh, Lopez Obrador. Right now, even the uh, opposition uh, inside the unions are calling for vote uh, to Lopez Obrador. Actually, uh, uh, Subcomandante Marcos, uh, the, the leadership of the Zapatista army, mm, made some ambiguous uh, um, uh, statements about how position to take on Lopez Obrador. Uh, because even Lopez Obrador is not, is not even a, a, refor a reformist as was the Kirchnerismo or also the PT. I mean, uh, uh, it must, it, it's most right wing, actually. Mm -hmm. But it looks like a huge uh, threatening to the pre uh, regime and the, and the right wing uh, parties and the capitalist parties. So, but we are calling for the uh, blank vote. <laughs> We're not the most popular people right now in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, okay. Okay. Okay, the, yes. You and then you and then you, okay? All right. All right. Well, soy Argentina. Oh. <laughs> I am from Argentina, so I, I'm going to. But this, I have to say, the three are very good, and thank you so much for the this <coughs> that you provide us. But I would like you to, to explain a little bit more about the movement of the picketeros and, uh, and the, uh, uh, what was the, the name of the. This is and um, actually what they have done in the country is international too. I think if they are going uh, Sanon is yes, kind of very not known. Yes. And um, for for uh, Brazil, for Brazil, I, I have the sense that what you are saying is that there is a, a political vacuum in, in Brazil and. Uh, it's only uh, the workers' movement uh, um, really trying to do something. So what, what is the future uh, in that sense? And, uh, and, and, and for Mexico, what, what about the, the NAFTA? What is the position? Uh, I mean, okay. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good question. OK, okay. you? Colombia, 
um, with the Salvo Petro now going to the second round. Yeah. I guess as a general question, would he be worth, for all three of you, would he be worthy of support from either a Marxist or a, a simple opportunist or strategic standpoint? Um, the PTS um, talks about independence of the working class, and that, of course, is um, from capitalist parties, and that, of course, is critical, and we Spartacus fight for that. But other countries have mass bourgeois workers' parties, which are, you know, independent workers' parties, but they have a bourgeois program of reform. And right now, um, the PTS has been in a block with the PO and the IS in the left workers front, which is a rotten block. So the program calls for things like workers control of industry, um, tax the rich, workers and people's government, but all underneath capitalism, all underneath a capitalist state, okay? Um, and <clears throat> we need to, the task has to be building a Bolshevik party that is going to get rid of the capitalist state and replace it with the dictatorship of the proletariat. And in fact, in the FIT program, um, you know, there's nothing about revolution at all, except for a mention of Arab revolution. So it's not a revolutionary program at all. Now, nationalizations have happened under capitalism many times. We defend them, but it doesn't change the nature of the system. And really what's needed is a worker's uh, government, which would be based on Soviets, um, and that is very contrary to what the... Um, the PTS and the MTS fight for. In fact, both of these organizations put an enormous amount of resources into running in the capital elections, including in like the constituent assembly, which is a total fraud in Mexico. And we call this electoral cretinism. Okay, I just want to quote from Trotsky, since he described the social democracy as the acceptance of rep reformist oppositional activity the actual training of the masses to become imbued with the inviability of the bourgeois state. And I would argue that's what you're doing. But in what Bolsheviks do, Trotsky said, was the training, temporizing, and organizing of the proletarian vanguard to enable the working class to take power, arms in hand. Okay, and as long as all these, even reforms are good, of course we have to mobilize the working class to get them. You don't get them ever, and the Communist International says this too, in the uh, electoral arena. And just one last thing, um, really the question we pose is, reform, are you fighting for reform or fighting for revolution? And the Communist International says the parliament is in no case the arena to fight for reform and the betterment of the working class. The Communist Party is there to sabotage it, fight for the dictatorship of the proletariat, which have a mission to abolish the parliament. And so, um, Basically, um, I guess the question would be, you know, how can you call yourself trust? Because that's not trustyism. Thank you. Yes, Piquetero movement and the taken factories movement. Well, I, I think uh, both uh, were very, very interesting. Ah, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, both, they are very, very interested movements in Argentina uh, because it uh, was a, a way of the working class and the, the, the it's okay. Of um, the working class, but the, the poorest uh, sectors of the working class uh, was the way they, they, they could build a response to neo ne neoliberalism. I think it's important uh, to understand these two movements, worker movements, uh, it's important to know that the, the unions uh, were uh, participate in the in the neoliberal reforms if if not you you cannot understand why the unemployment can uh, have to build 
its own organization, you know? So that's the first point. The second uh, is about the, the, the factories, the, the taken uh, factories movement um, that was very, very important. And it was another response to unemployment. You have one response in the picketary movement, it's, it's a response in the, in the neighborhoods that trying to get food, try, uh, fighting for, for work, for shops, and you have another moment that taken a factories moment uh, that uh, built a, another response that was taken the factories. Mm -hmm. Yes, when the, the factory was closed, they taken the factories. And there's a lot of, uh, there was, not there are, there, was a, uh, there were a lot of uh, factories, taken factories. And, uh, and there was a very interesting uh, debate in that moment in 2001, 2002, about what to do with the factory. And you had uh, two wings, the cooperative wing, yes, and the Workers control wing or control yes, if, uh, worker control wing, and it was very interesting political discussion because the uh, the point was why uh, what are we taking the factory for? Yes. So in in one hand, the the cooperative wing says, well, we are taking the factory to have shop. Yes, because we we need a shop. That's all, and we need to eat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the other uh, wing said, "Yes, we are taking the factory with that. We, we we need a shop. We have to eat, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. But, but uh, these factories ca uh, could be a point of support of other struggles. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that Sanon is Sanon because of that, because it's, uh, it's the best example of that kind of politics. You know, for example, that very, very, uh, well, the experience, Sanon experience is beautiful, but uh, they had like, we, call, we, we could say like, an, uh, they tried to have an hegemonic policy. Mm -hmm. uh, try to make alliances with other sectors of the popular sector. For example, there's a, a very interesting, uh, when, when Sanon, um, they, they were uh, in, in danger because the, the police were going to enter in, into the, to the factory, there was a strike in the, how do you say, the, um, the shale? Uh, the, yeah, and then the jail, the, the jail was nearby. Yes, the, the, the prison. Yeah, the prisons yeah. make a strike and and give and gave the the food to support Sanon. Well, when you have something like that, you say, wow, 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 it, it, this people is, 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 is Yes, it's very interesting, and well, uh, and I think that uh, that idea that that uh, make Sanon a, a, a space of organizing other struggles is is what made uh, Sanon very very important, uh, uh, and the democratic way of Sanon uh, of taking uh, decisions. Yes, um, and what else? And well. Lady, uh, I think, first of all, the feed is an electoral front, yes, uh, with a, that is conformed with three different parties. We are not one party because we have differences, of course, if not, we, 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 we are from a, a, a party, a common party. But, and, and we have a difference in, in, in different uh, uh, politics, etc., but we have a common program. Yes, and that program is uh, is for workers' uh, government. Yes, that's the idea. Is uh, yes, it is. Is is in the letter. Right. Yes, it's in the letter. Yes, it's in the letter of the program. It's uh, because uh, this electoral front w uh, wants to put on the agenda, on the political agenda, that that point that the workers can be the government that the workers can be uh, can make politics and can be it can can uh, take the political class out of the government and uh, and make politics themselves so uh, i think that the one important thing is that is that uh, the fit is an electoral a front is not a party, it's not a revolutionary party, it's an electoral front. So, uh, and, and I think I don't agree with you that we waste uh, so much 
energy and time in, in, in elections. No, because I don't think that elections are very important, and they are very important. And I think Trotsky thought that they are very important. Uh, but, uh, but what I try to say is that what we do now in the electoral arena is a product of what we do in this class struggle. In Sanon, in the factories uh, where we are, in the human uh, rights movement, in the women movement, we, we build our power, our small power, we need much more power than we have. Uh, we build our, our power in the class struggle and the, in the real movements, yes? Uh, and the elections and the electoral arena is a way of uh, saying it in a loud voice to a lot of people. And I think that, uh, for example, it's not a, <coughs> it's, it's, it's not a, a, a casualty that, for example, a, a worker as Raul Godoy, the main uh, leader of uh, uh, Sanon, mm -hmm. is our deputy in, in in, in Neuquén, in a county in the south part of the, of the, of the country. Because uh, it's the expression of what we want to do with the, with the, with the elections and with the, the parliamentary, to be the representatives of the working class to, 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 and to strengthen the class struggle with uh, its position, her pos his, his position in the parliament. So I think it's, that's what we think about elections.